Cohen Veterans Bioscience is a nonprofit research alliance whose mission is to transform veterans' mental health through translational research. We are focused on understanding the molecular and biological underpinnings of diseases such as PTSD to develop better treatments and diagnostics. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me walk through some logistics. This program is being recorded and will be archived on the Cohen Veterans Bioscience YouTube channel and website. The presentation will be 40 minutes in length followed by Q&A. Please use the chat button to post a question. Today our speaker is Dr. Julian Ford. Dr. Ford is an expert in the diagnosis and treatment of traumatic stress. He is a clinical psychologist and professor of psychiatry at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. He also oversees multiple programs related to juvenile and adolescent traumatic stress treatment and rehabilitation. In addition to these roles, he is an editor for multiple academic journals related to research in traumatic stress and has authored over 75 papers and books on the topic himself. Over the course of his career, Dr. Ford has counseled hundreds of people from all backgrounds affected by traumatic stress. Because of his deep experience treating traumatized individuals, numerous agencies have consulted with him on the treatment and prevention of traumatic stress, including the World Health Organization, the National Institutes of Health, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and the Centers for Disease Control. Dr. Ford earned his Ph.D. in psychology from SUNY Stony Brook and his bachelor's degree also in psychology from the University of Michigan. In today's webinar, Dr. Ford will present on the current tools available for the evaluation and tracking of the progression of PTSD and how these tools relate to the prognosis and treatment of PTSD. Thank you, and now I'll hand it over to Dr. Ford. Great. Thank you very much, Allison. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to present this webinar. Um, this is a very important topic, and Cohen Bioscience is doing work that is crucial to understanding the impact of traumatic stress on the brain, including post-traumatic stress disorder. And so, as a result, I think a good place to start in talking about the assessment and treatment planning for post-traumatic stress disorder is to actually consider and step back and think about the hundreds of research studies that have been done over the past decade or two on the impact of traumatic stress on the brain. And Martin Teicher and his colleague, Dr. Sampson, wrote a, a extraordinary review paper in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2013 and summarizing the the results of literally hundreds of studies their their summary in one paragraph I think is one of the most compelling descriptions of how PTSD actually originates in the brain and then that helps us to understand what it is that we're attempting to assess and to actually treat. So the, the quote which you see on your screen begins with the, the thalamus and the sensory cortex which process threats and convey that information to the amygdala. The prefrontal cortex and regions there around modulate the amygdala's response either turning it down with the realization that something is actually not a threat or irrationally amplifying it. And in some cases, it's not irrational, unfortunately. Post-traumatic stress might seem irrational. Traumatic stress is not irrational. There is actually a threat. The hippocampus then is involved in processing this information and playing a key role in retrieving relevant explicit memories and modulating the response to psychological stressors. In other words, the, the hippocampus is almost like a kind of a search engine for relevant memories to find what it is that we need to know in order to understand what's going on and how to handle the situation that is stressful and that triggers the amygdala attention and alarm reaction. That modulation can then lead the amygdala to integrate new information and to signal lower brain areas such as the locus ceruleus which generate and regulate the autonomic nervous system, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and the many other stress hormones including the noradrenergic response. So this is a very thorough description of how stressors that are literally life-threatening and that is one of the major aspects of traumatic stressors, those stressors lead to a chain of reactions in the brain that are, is entirely adaptive. And when that chain of reactions, however, becomes stuck and is not reset after the threat is no longer present, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> 
We know from a variety of research studies, uh, some of which I've summarized briefly here, that individuals from, our, from the military services who develop PTSD, they tend to have smaller amygdala and left side hippocampal volumes. In other words, two of the areas that are most crucial in the brain for actually managing the response to a current or a life-threatening past stressor are potentially underpowered because they simply don't have the volume that is necessary in order to allocate the neural resources to do the modulation that Dr. Teichers and Samson just described. Those individuals also tend to have a smaller anterior cingulate, caudate, hypothalamus, left side insula, and middle temporal gyrus, all of which are correlated with the severity of PTSD symptoms, suggesting that PTSD amongst military personnel and veterans may have to do with a shift in the activation patterns in the brain. Not so much necessarily the structure of the brain or its integrity, but the activation patterns such that prolonged stress responses that are unmodulated can develop. PTSD is also the third bullet down. It's related to an increased insula hippocampus and amygdala activation related to negative but not positive stimuli such as angry faces. So we have an individual whose brain is highly attuned to the potential for threat and potentially leaning toward a hypervigilant approach to interpreting stimuli which may be absolutely on the objective side may be literally not threats at all. On the other hand, they may signify in a conditioned stressor and conditioned stress paradigm, they may signify the potential of danger and that can potentially reactivate this very vicious cycle of intense brain activation to mobilize the body to prepare for and to handle threat. When childhood trauma and or combat trauma have incurred, there is an increased cingulate activation in response to negative stimuli. So again, more evidence that trauma, including childhood trauma, and of course when that's combined with combat trauma, that can lead to some, some very strong cumulative amplified effects. And finally, hypermetabolism in the brain areas for arousal regulation, fear responses, and reward resp processing persist not only while the military veteran or military personnel are awake, but also during rapid eye movement sleep, meaning that there really is no rest for the weary with PTSD. They can become trapped in a almost perpetual arousal state. And these are some references to the, the articles that I've just cited, which you can check if you'd like. We know that in order to assess PTSD, we have to understand what it is that we're actually assessing. And there have been some important revisions, one that's proposed in the International Classification of Diseases, and one that has occurred about two years ago in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. The first is the proposal for a complex form of PTSD, which is not in the DSM, but maybe in the next version, the version 11 of the International Classification of Disease. And that includes three fundamental types of impairments over and above the classic PTSD symptoms of intrusive re-experiencing, avoidance, and hyperarousal and hypervigilance. And those include affect dysregulation, fundamental shift in one's sense of self and functioning related to oneself, including both a sense of self as diminished, defeated, or worthless, and at times pervasive feelings of shame or guilt about oneself. And finally, relational functioning, such that the individual has difficulty sustaining relationships or feeling close to others. Well, these are all not uncommon aspects of post-traumatic stress reactions and post-traumatic stress disorder in military personnel and military veterans. Emotions that become very intense or become incredibly shut down and sometimes even dissociated and from which the individual has difficult time recovering even if they make the greatest of efforts and despite their intelligence and their social support a sense that oneself has been fundamentally changed and that there is something fundamentally damaged or diminished about oneself, and a 
a sense that relationships are no longer somehow the source of succulence and support that one had always assumed that they could be and should be. That's a, that's a prescription for a fundamental sense of powerlessness, not over external stressors so much, but over one's internal state and a loss of contact with supportive others. In the DSM, without a complex PTSD addition to the diagnosis, in the DSM-5, PTSD has actually become much more complex. And so I'm going to show you very quickly, the, in the green font, you will see the additions to the DSM from the DSM-4. In trauma exposure, the fundamental aspects of trauma exposure are, un are unchanged. However, there is no longer the requirement that there has to be significant fear, helplessness, or horror at the time of or shortly after the experience of a traumatic stressor. And that's largely because most individuals who experience these stressors and go on to develop post-traumatic stress symptoms will report when asked to recall their experience at the time of a traumatic stressor, will report will report that they felt a sense of fear, helplessness, or horror. Now, they often don't use those words. And so many times this has led to an under-detection of PTSD diagnostically because people won't necessarily say that they were scared, that they felt helpless or horrified, but they may say that they just shut down or they felt dazed or they felt sickened by the experience or they felt a sense that life would never be the same or they would never be the same. And those are all very much aspects of a sense of helplessness and horror, but they're often missed in the diagnostic enterprise. Nevertheless, Currently now, we don't have to be concerned about that because all that really is required to begin the diagnosis of PTSD is the, an exposure to actual or witnessed or secondhand, when it's a very, very close family member or friend, exposure to a life-threatening or a sexually violating experience or set of events. In terms of intrusive re-experiencing the fundamental symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, the unwanted and troubling memories that seem to spontaneously recur, the primary change is simply that nightmares don't have to mimic the content of a traumatic event. So it's important to recognize that in diagnostically assessing PTSD, it's, it's important to not rule out dreams that have the same kind of affective content, the sense of shock, horror, threat, exploitation, abandonment, betrayal, terror, anger, rage, all of those kinds of affective dynamics can infuse themselves into dreams and we've seen that uh, that has neurobiological substrates because of the effect that PTSD has biologically on the individual even when they're asleep. But it doesn't have to be a dream that directly mimics the actual exposure. And it's also true that the intense or prolonged distress that is triggered by exposure to cues that are reminders, basically conditioned stimuli, those can now be cues that are symbolic. And we've, all, we've always known this, that in many cases the, the most intense and the most potent stimuli to trigger intrusive distress, which may or may not be accompanied by a conscious memory, are often triggers that are apparently innocuous. They may be anniversaries, they may be times of year, they may be weather, they may be innocuous noises, they may be birthdays, they may be celebrations that were ultimately completely changed as a result of exposure to traumatic stress. So the kinds of cues that can trigger intrusive re-experiencing are not limited to those that are directly related and clearly mimic the kinds of cues that were experienced in the traumatic event itself. And that's really crucial, again, in order to not under-detect PTSD. The avoidance symptoms are fundamentally the same as they have been, but now they comprise a separate criterion. So it's, a, it's crucial to have at least one of these two types of avoidance symptoms in order to meet the criteria for a diagnosis of PTSD. Although I would remind you that it's very rare for individuals who have 
post-traumatic stress memories or intrusive reactions that are affective or physiological or both. It's very rare for individuals to have those kinds of intrusive re-experiencing symptoms and not attempt to avoid them. It's almost counterintuitive and it's almost non-adaptive to not try to avoid because those are so disturbing, they're troubling, they interrupt one's train of thought, they interrupt one's ability to be present in the moment and to feel one's feelings and to think clearly and make good decisions and act on those decisions. And so as a result, avoidance is a highly adaptive reaction that becomes a part of the symptom complex because it's unfortunately, ultimately, its intention is adaptive, but its effect is to only prolong and increase the intensity of intrusive re-experiencing. So always be aware that when individuals say, well, no, I don't avoid anything that reminds me, uh, or I don't avoid thinking about the, the, those past events, they may be able to avoid in ways that are so second nature, and they may be avoiding in ways that are perfectly adaptive on the surface. I just don't watch certain kinds of movies. I just don't talk to certain people. If people's voices get loud, I just step back and don't participate. These are all potentially entirely adaptive reactions that also may be parts of avoidance because they may be intended not only to modulate emotions in the moment and deal with social and other kinds of situations effectively, but they may also be an attempt to shut out or to shut down the intensity of intrusive re-experiencing and triggered reactivity. Then there is a new criterion set in the DSM PTSD diagnosis for PTSD, and that's called negative alterations in cognitions and mood that began in or after the trauma. And these include some classic PTSD symptoms like psychogenic amnesia, anhedonia, detachment, and persistent inability to experience positive emotions or emotional numbing. But they've added three that are very important. And one is fundamentally persistently altered and exaggerated negative expectations about the world, the future, and oneself. And this parallels the complex PTSD set of symptoms that have to do with fundamentally altered self-perceptions. But it extends beyond that to relationships and to the ultimate sense of having a future. The second, set of, or the second type of symptom that's been added is a persistent sense of blame of self or others related to the traumatic event or events. And that's not at all uncommon. That often has been called survival guilt. It can also take the form of in incredibly intense anger and blame towards others who should have prevented things from happening or stopped them. And that can become a very pathological reaction, even if it's actually in many ways a rational interpretation of fundamental failures on the part of self or others, but it undermines the ability of the individual to trust themselves and to trust others, and that can just intensify the biological stress response. And finally, there's also the addition of pervasive negative emotion states. So now we know that PTSD is no longer just an anxiety disorder. It includes anxiety, but it also includes anger, guilt, sadness, grief, distress, disgust, blame, a wide variety of emotion states that go well beyond anxiety. And we have to be thoughtful about that in doing assessments. And finally, the, the, the fourth symptom criterion set for PTSD in the DSM-5, again, has become much more complex. Now, in addition to irritability and anger problems, there's also potentially problems with aggressive behavior. And that is not required. An individual can be simply irritable and prone to anger or even anger outbursts without being actually aggressive in a sense that is dangerous emotionally or physically, but it can extend all the way to aggressive behavior. And for individuals who've experienced combat, having experienced so much aggression directed toward them and sometimes having had to use aggression in defense of themselves and their comrades and on behalf of their mission, they've often had to use aggression and channel it and harness it. And once unleashed, that's a, a very powerful force that is sometimes very difficult to restrain, even by individuals who fundamentally are not aggressive by nature and abhor aggression. It also can lead to reckless or self-destructive behavior, and this can in include intentional self-harm, 
uh, which is typically accompanied by a kind of dissociative loss of awareness. It can also include recklessness that is a kind of a bring it on, I don't care, I'm indestructible, or I've been through so much that nothing can hurt me anymore, or I don't care if I'm hurt, or even searching, seeking to be harmed to in some ways validate that sense that something I've done is so terrible that I deserve to be punished. So as you can see, the symptoms have become much more complex. Hypervigilance is still a core anchor symptom as well as the startle response. Difficulties with concentration that just make it difficult for the individual to be able to step back and reflect and regroup. And ultimately, sleep disturbance, which can make it difficult for the individual to ever rest and to ever reset the biological stress response. So PTSD has really now become a multi-domain disorder of self-regulation. And I didn't even mention there's the addition of, an, of a dissociative subtype of PTSD to the DSM-5 for the individual who may have many of the other PTSD symptoms but may not experience hyperarousal so much as a profound sense of shutdown and a loss of awareness of self that can be a depersonalization or of the environment which can be a derealization. So dissociation sometimes is the form that is prominent in PTSD rather than hyperarousal per se, but it's also often interspersed with periods of hyperarousal and then shut down in the form of dissociative spacing out or detachment or disorientation. So PTSD is now a difficulty with physiological sensory perceptual as well as emotional and cognitive self-regulation. The individual is literally trying to process information as if they were still experiencing the profound stressor. And as a result, their interactions with the environment in terms of their motivations, the motivation to escape, to shut it down, to shut it out, to just simply get through life can lead to a, a, a kind of a shift over into a self-medication perspective and a, addictive behaviors or an isolation or a behavioral kind of shift into impulsivity that can lead the individual to take risks that they would otherwise never take. And it can lead to obviously fundamental problems with relationships and one's self of one's, one's sense of oneself. So this is not a, a simple thing to assess. And I'm not going to be able to go through the full armamentarium of PTSD assessments. There are many and they are widely uh, available and many valuable ones. I'm going to highlight four ones, four assessments that are representative of many others. Um, and many of them can be found. A, an excellent website, which I will show at, at the end, is the National Center for PTSD, which is really the central source for information for military PTSD assessment and treatment, as well as neurobiology and many other uh, sources of, or many other types of information. On that website, you will find more information, but I'm going to highlight three measures that have been well developed for the screening the self-report assessment and the structured interview diagnosis of PTSD, and then a newer measure that some colleagues have developed uh, that is a measure for clinicians to use to actually rate PTSD symptoms because sometimes the clinician's perspective adds a really useful alternative perspective and provides that kind of third dimension that is sometimes missing in even the best self-report or the best structured interviewing. So starting with screening, the primary care PTSD screen, uh, that's a measure that you can see it here on the screen itself. It's so brief that you can, you can see the whole measure. Basically asks if the individual has had what essentially is a traumatic experience, but in down-to-earth terms. And then if they've had four types of symptoms. And those symptoms include sleep disturbances or spontaneous intrusive memories and unwanted thoughts. So intrusive re-experiencing both at sleep or awake avoidance, hypervigilance, and hyperarousal, and then finally emotional numbing and detachment from others. So you see that this is basically uh, capturing the DSM-4 PTSD criterion set. It has not yet been updated or has not been updated and published uh, and released publicly uh, for DSM-5, although that is underway. Uh, but it still is a very useful initial screen. It doesn't capture all of the emotion dysregulation that DSM-5 PTSD includes.
includes, but it does capture enough that it can be extremely useful and has been widely used in military uh, and veteran populations and treatment programs. Um, it's also been used in substance abuse treatment. Um, and you can see that for screening, a somewhat lower threshold is recommended based on research that's been done by Dr. Prinz and Kimmerling and their colleagues for substance abuse treatment. Uh, clients and a slightly higher screening threshold for individuals in primary care to not overdetect them. And here's a citation to a couple of the articles uh, that Dr. Prinz and her colleagues have done in case you want to follow up on this. Again, it's also av available on the National Center for PTSD website. So that's an excellent initial screening that can be done in literally two minutes in a primary care clinic, in a substance abuse treatment, in a PTSD clinic, in a mental health clinic, in a homelessness shelter, um, in a veteran support program, in a, a vet center. As long as it's followed up, that's the crucial thing. It's essential to never do this screening and then just leave the individual with no follow-up whatsoever. They need to know that either they might benefit from some additional information about and potentially some further inquiry about post-traumatic stress as it may be affecting them without assuming that that is the case or that their family members and others who are there to support them might benefit from that information as well. Or they need to know that this is really not a concern at this point in time, but now they've seen that these are the kinds of symptoms that might warrant some attention should they develop and become a problem for the individual at any time in the future. That follow-up is absolutely crucial. That can lead then to assessment. For example, a brief assessment is the self-report measure, the PTSD checklist or the PCL-5, which has been updated for the DSM-5. And that's a 20-item self-report questionnaire, which is essentially captures all 20 of the DSM-5 PTSD symptoms. It takes between five and 10 minutes, so it's very brief, but it's longer than a two-minute screener. It's, a, it's done with each symptom rated on a scale of 0 to 4, and note that the scale is somewhat different. Those of you who've used the PCL for the DSM-4 would be used to a 1 to 5 scoring system, so now the scores are 20 points lower because the scoring system is 0 to 4 for each symptom, ranging from not at all to extremely. And the scoring, again, is the range is from 0 to 80 now with the DSM-5. The scoring for the symptom clusters can be very useful clinically. Um, and if you want to identify a probable or likely PTSD, again, not certain, but at least worth, worth pursuing with some further diagnostic assessment or observation and education, items that are scored greater than or equal to 2, meaning moderately, and following the DSM-5 diagnostic rules, which is at least one intrusive re-experiencing symptom, one avoidance symptom, two symptoms of fundamentally altered cognition and emotions, and two hyperarousal and hypervigilance symptoms. That's a, a very useful research-based uh, diagnostic uh, indicator. Again, not a diagnosis, but an indicator for the need for further follow-up. It's also most likely to be the case if the individual's overall score, the total score on all 20 symptoms, is greater than 38. That's the recommended cutoff based upon some early research, um, and it looks quite robust. Again, individuals who score lower than that or don't meet criteria for full PTSD, it's really crucial clinically to assess and think carefully about symptoms that are indicated as a 3 or a 4, where they are severe or extreme. So the individual may not endorse enough to be diagnostically identified, but there still may be some really important treatment implications, and those should not be overlooked in the rush to just determine diagnosis, yes or no. The next step in diagnostic assessment is to do a full structured interview or semi-structured interview, and the clinician-administered PTSD scale for the DSM-5, the CAPS, is really the gold standard, and that, again, has been updated. Um, it includes 30... Uh, semi-structured interview items, 20 capturing the 20 PTSD symptoms, also items that capture the onset, the duration, and the subjective assess distress associated with each of the PTSD symptoms, or with, excuse me, with all of them, 
the impact on social and vocational functioning, which is crucial because symptoms alone do not make a diagnosis. There has to be a discernible impact on social or vocational functioning. And it also can be used to assess improvement if it's done on a repeated basis. And this is really very important in, in terms of actually looking at progress in treatment. There are some response validity and PTSD severity items as well. And there are two items for dissociative symptoms. The CAPS now, it begins with the identification of a single traumatic event. We know that many times military veterans and personnel have had multiple traumatic or potentially traumatic events over the course of their lifetimes, not necessarily just in the military and not necessarily just as adults. Uh, but the importance here is to identify a primary traumatic event that can be the basis for symptom inquiry on the basis that it's very difficult for people to report and sometimes they will over-report symptoms if they can link them to dozens or many, many different traumatic events, whereas a single traumatic event will actually serve as the, kind of the prototype for all of the traumas that the individuals experience. Now, that doesn't mean that that should be the only trauma that would be a focus in the treatment, not, not whatsoever. That would be very simplistic and not a good idea at all. On the other hand, for the purposes of assessment, the symptoms really need to be tied to a kind of a, a primary currently affecting traumatic event. It's not necessarily the worst that's ever happened, but the one that is most troubling to the individual currently. And the items are now rated with a single severity score. Those of you who used the CAPS in previous versions know that it used to involve both a frequency and an intensity score. Now frequency and intensity have been combined in a very economical fashion to generate a single score that is a composite of frequency and intensity. And that ranges from zero, which is the symptom is absent, to four, the symptom is, is frequent and incapacitating. And it's important to, in diagnosing PTSD to only consider those symptoms that are at least moderate or threshold, that is, that, that are clearly present, have been present in the past 30 days, and that have an effect on functioning. Even though they may not be severe, they still have an impact on functioning, or they require effort in order to cope with and to manage and maintain. And those are two critical concepts for assessing PTSD. So for example, these are, the, these are the criteria that are used from zero to four in order to determine whether a symptom is absent, mild or subthreshold. that is it's present, but there's really very limited of any clinically significant distress or impairment. And again, always taking into account the propensity for people with PTSD to understate the degree of distress or impairment as part of their avoidance symptoms. And then whether the symptom is moderate, which is clinically significant distress. In other words, it requires effort to cope with and some impairment of functioning and at least two times a month and then severe or extreme. The fourth measure that I want you to, to know about, it takes a different perspective and that is the, the clinician's perspective. And this is a 12-item clinician symptom severity rating that Drs. Opler, Monsenmeyer, Shelley, and Grennan have developed. Um, and it's, desire, it's designed largely to measure change. So it's, really, it's not a diagnostic instrument. The time frame for assessing symptoms is the past week, not the past month, as is done with the CAPS and the PCL. Um, it's really intended to get a snapshot of how the individual is doing over a period of time that can involve the course of treatment or it can involve following the individual while assessing whether they may be in need of supportive services or treatment at some point in the future. And it involves items that are directly parallel to the DSM-4 PTSD symptom set because it was actually developed while DSM-4 PTSD was in effect. But it also includes items that are very similar to those in the more complex PTSD proposed for the ICD-11 and in the DSM-5 PTSD. So these are symptoms that have to do with emotion dysregulation, with difficulties in relationships or interpersonal dysregulation, negative self-perception, you can see these are very consistent with the DSM-5 and the ICD, 
with impulsivity, difficulties in inhibiting impulsive or potentially reckless or dangerous behavior, as well as dissociation, which is not fundamentally included in the DSM PTSD criterion set, although psychogenic amnesia and flashbacks are two symptoms that are very much likely to be to involve P dissociation and the dissociative subtype of PTSD in the, D in the DSM-5 clearly has dissociative symptoms. There are also three other symptoms that go a little bit beyond those in the complex PTSD and the DSM-5 PTSD symptom set, but those are symptoms that are well documented with hundreds of research studies as sequelae of complex trauma exposure and those include impairments in sexuality, demoralization, a sense the, of loss of faith in people, in spirituality, in any kind of future, and fundamental problems with bodily dysregulation that often are a component of affect dysregulation but need to really be considered separately because for many individuals with PTSD they experience all kinds of bodily dysregulation as a result of the hyperarousal or the hypoarousal involved in dissociation that may not be evidently affecting their emotions but that create a great deal of distress a propensity towards either under reporting or over-reporting pain or difficulty in recovering from pain or other kinds of stress-related disorders which may be complicated by, not caused, but complicated or exacerbated by PTSD. The SOTS has a, a very nice semi-structured interview protocol that can be done in 20 minutes or so. Um, so it's, it's briefer than the CAPS. It does not have to be done. It, this can be done based upon clinician observation when a clinician is very familiar with and has worked extensively with a, a patient or a client, but the structured interview gives some guidance for how to specifically identify and rate the symptoms. Here are the, again, the 12 symptoms in the SOTS that I've just described. And the symptoms are rated on a seven point scale, so it's a little bit more complicated than either the PCL or the, uh, the CAPS, but that's to give clinicians an opportunity to really describe the extent to which the symptom needs to be addressed from absent or minimal or mild, which correspond to the absent and mild in the, the PCL and the CAPS, to moderate, which is very similar to the, that in others. That is essentially the symptom is present and it's affecting the individual in ways that are causing some interference within functioning. And then a little bit more detail on the dis distinction between severe that's moderate, severe that is clear, and extreme levels of severe incapacitating symptoms. So very similar to the CAPS and the PCL, a little bit more nuance to allow the clinician to identify levels of change in PTSD symptoms that you sometimes can't do with briefer or with scales that have a, a lesser degree of variability. So in treatment planning, to, to wrap up our talk today, even though the focus has really been on screening assessment of uh, PTSD, obviously the purpose of this is to provide information that can lead into very indiv individualized and trauma-informed psychoeducation. So not just telling the person that they've been through trauma and, of course, they're having normal reactions to abnormal circumstances, but going beyond that to also talk about some of the specific ways in which they appear to have adapted to traumatic stressors. And those adaptations continue on in ways that are getting in the way in their life and may be causing severe distress or impairment, but that originally were highly adaptive. And so education that helps the individual recognize that they were just trying to self-regulate when they were going through life-threatening or horrifying or terrifying experiences and as they were trying to protect those that they cared about and accomplish their missions and now they're still trying to self-regulate but those stress responses sometimes just seem to continue as if the stressor was still present and that is something that occurs regardless of the individual's intelligence their knowledge this is a biological adaptation where the body simply does not know that it's safe and as a result it's really important to think about the kinds of social skills that can in enable the individual, even if they're feeling a profound sense of detachment from relationships, an emotional numbing or dissociation or distrust or anger and irritability, to be able to negotiate ways to 
make contact and begin to sustain or continue to sustain contact with others in a way where they don't have to hide their symptoms or feel ashamed or stigmatized by them, but where they can literally work with the people in their life on turning those symptoms into ways to adapt that are currently effective that aren't emergency adaptations or sur survival adaptations, but could be if there was ever a survival situation in the future. And that involves trauma memory processing in some cases, but that can be done on a therapeutic basis with prolonged exposure or cognitive processing therapy or EMDR or narrative exposure therapy or other trauma memory processing therapies. It can also be done on a present-centered basis where the individual does trauma memory processing not by evoking the memories in the treatment setting itself, but by being aware of memories that are evoked partially or fully in their daily life and being able to actually recognize those as opportunities to actually process the information currently, recognize the impact of the past experience, so putting together the memory of the past, the current situation, and rather than trying to divorce those by avoiding the memory of the past, to actually be, draw on the memory of the past and use it to help orient to the current situation and to actually calibrate one's reaction to the current situation, which some uh, Roger Pittman just wrote a wonderful article that was published in Biological Psychiatry that talks about memory updating. Well, this is an aspect of treatment that we're just beginning to understand. It's not just biological. There are biological ways that this potentially can be done, but a lot of it is cognitive and behavioral. And it's updating the memory rather than avoiding it or eliminating it that is what enables an individual to be able to actually come to terms with PTSD. In order to do that, they have to know what ways they are responding now that are actually interfering with them being able to draw on the memory and use it rather than to avoid it or fear it or just react to it. And that's where a very individualized use of the symptoms that are identified in the assessment becomes much more informative than simply an overall diagnosis or a trauma symptom severity score. It's far more, uh, it enables the clinician to be far more individualized in their treatment if they specifically work with the symptoms that are highly endorsed and that are highly affecting the individual and help them see that it's not a process of getting rid of those symptoms, but it's really a process of being able to use the symptoms adaptively. And that's a, that's a non-intuitive concept for clinicians as well as for patients and clients. But it can be very intuitively adaptive for individuals who recognize that they have to learn from their experiences and use their experiences. And military personnel are geniuses at doing that. Pharmacotherapy can sometimes be helpful for very specific symptoms. Um, uh, Prazosin is a good example of a, of a medication that specifically helps with hyperarousal and nightmares, but it won't work with every individual. It's not that well targeted. And ultimately, we have to be able to monitor how treatment is going. And that's where a measure like the SOTS could be enormously helpful. Well, I hope that this, inter this overview has been helpful to you um, and it's given you some ideas about PTSD assessment and some resources. Here are, as I mentioned, some excellent websites for more information about the PCPTSD, the PCL5, and the CAPS5, as well as a, just a, a host of information about PTSD treatment and assessment resources, the PTSD, National Center for PTSD website. And for more information about the SOTS, which is not as widely disseminated. There are two individuals at the at mental health services systems that would be glad to provide information to anybody interested about the SOTS. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Allison. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Ford. Um, it was really in-depth and thoughtful, and I think we learned a lot about the way PTSD is measured and also about the heterogeneity and diversity of symptoms that patients experience and that clinicians see in the clinic and in the field. Great. Um, so I will start with questions. I actually first would like to thank Prophase, um, a global provider of specialty services focused on the development of clinical instruments in the CNS disorders uh, that connected us with you. And Sophia Jovic, the CEO of Prophase, actually uh, submitted 
a question that I'll ask for her since she doesn't have audio on the webinar right now. So she says, Dr. Ford, thank you for providing such a thorough overview of measurements of the measurements and issues in PTSD. Can you share your thoughts and considerations for applying these instruments in a community mental health setting, especially as it relates to clinician training and clinician burden? That's, a, that's an excellent question. And while many, many military personnel are seen in VA clinics and hospitals, there also are countless military veterans and their families and others who've experienced post-traumatic stress uh, who are seen in community mental health agencies all over the country. And we all know that every therapist, every counselor, every clinician, every staff member in community mental health centers are incredibly overworked. Uh, they're doing valiant jobs. Um, they do not need to have more added to their workload. So the question really is, what's the value added of doing this assessment? Well, I would suggest that in so many cases, what we found is that when you start with an assessment or when you're working with a client in a community mental health setting on an ongoing basis, you often begin by thinking about the, the more familiar DSM-5 diagnoses, depressive disorders or anxiety disorders or very severe uh, psychiatric disorders, psychosis, schizophrenia, all of those disorders, and bipolar disorder I should mention, as well as substance abuse disorders. Now all of those disorders are often unfortunately more often in a clinical setting than in the community comorbid with PTSD mm -hmm. and large large numbers as, as many as 90 plus percent of clients in community mental health centers all over the country some wonderful research that Kim Muser and his group have done and others have done as well demonstrate that most clients who go to community mental health centers are not only struggling with with economic and, and other social kinds of challenges as well as psychiatric or mental health challenges but they are often they've often experienced traumatic events and are often experiencing post-traumatic stress if that's not identified then we never provide them with the treatment mm -hmm. and and the treatment doesn't have to be separate from the treatment that they would get otherwise. It can be very much intertwined with and interwoven into treatment that is done for substance abuse, for psychosis, for depression. So basically the, the, the crucial thing here is staff need to, learn, to know that there are very, very brief instruments they can use and I would suggest in a community mental health center rather than primarily uh, relying upon self-report by clients even though that certainly can be valuable I would strongly recommend using the CAPS or the PCL or the SOTS directly to mm -hmm. actually look at what you're seeing as a clinician and observe symptoms rather than asking the client to tell you all their symptoms look at what you're, what you're seeing right there in front of you and what you're hearing about and make some judgments not to diagnose the individual and add another diagnosis, but to open up the treatment possibility that maybe this individual will benefit from treatments for PTSD that are specifically designed to help the, the client to reduce their sense of stress reactivity. And that does not mean just doing trauma memory work either. There are many times, many times clinicians are concerned about doing trauma memory work with clients who have very significant psychiatric problems. It can be done. It can be very effective. It can also be something for which the client may not be in the right point, point in their treatment or in their stabilization process. But PTSD treatment is not limited to trauma memory processing. It can be done on a very present-centered basis too. So basically, I think... The, the value added is brief screening that's largely clinician or counselor or case manager based, mm -hmm. leading to new alternatives for treatment that can also be briefly and effectively interwoven, that can actually address what seem to be symptoms of depression, of mania, uh, that may be hyperarousal or dissociation, or that are complicated by hyperarousal or dissociation. So long answer to a very good question. I hope that was useful. Thank you. So Magali Haas, CEO of C Cohen Veterans Bioscience, has the next question. Dr. Ford, I'd like to thank you for a very clear and comprehensive overview of these tools as well. And my question for you is, um, as you know, there's an ongoing debate about whether we are under or over diagnosing PTSD in different populations. I wonder if you can comment on the accuracy of these array of tools that you've discussed and also 
whether the availability of a diagnostic test, uh, blood-based or imaging or other test, would support diagnosis and how? Well, the, that's a very good question, Megali. Thank you. Um, it's, it's true that there is no psychosocial diagnostic instrument that has perfect accuracy. Both the PCL and the CAPS-5 have very strong evidence of accuracy, but they will have false positives and false negatives. That, that is unavoidable, particularly when you're focusing specifically on the diagnostic accuracy. On the other hand, their greatest utility in many respects, even though I know we often have to have a diagnosis to justify the funding for treatment in a variety of settings, it's crucial to use those instruments and they are most accurate on a symptom by symptom basis and they're most accurate when they combine self-report with the clinician's observation. So I think it's really, it. yes, there is the potential to increase the accuracy with brain-based, with biologically-based markers, that's going to be very, very challenging only because PTSD is a complex heterogeneous condition. It is really not a single disorder. And so what we're going to really be looking for and what genetics researchers are looking for now in the field and doing some wonderful work, but there is no single bulletproof marker, genetic marker or a biological, neurobiological marker. There are some promising potential markers. John Crystal just gave a wonderful plenary address at the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies Conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. There is some really promising work on biological markers and that, yes, that needs to be added to our armamentarium, but it will not substitute for the very careful detailed inquiry about symptoms that combines both what the client tells us, what collateral members of the client's environment like family members can tell us, and what we as clinicians can observe. So a combination of all of the above. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience, Allison, or can I ask a second question? Um, I don't see anything from the audience right now, but I also have a question to follow up your question, Magali. But go ahead. Okay. Uh, my question, my question, Dr. Ford, is since you've mentioned um, other corollary data sets, um, what do you think about? collecting data directly from caregivers or using patient online media tools to collect information directly from patients, not just in the clinical setting, but um, mm -hmm. in a sort of more uh, in their home, in their life uh, time setting. Absolutely. That's, I'm glad you mentioned that. And that I think that really is a crucial next step. It's kind of a paradigm shift for all of us in the assessment field and the treatment field. Uh, something called ecological momentary analysis has been used for research studies and now is, is increasingly being used in, cl in clinical sites, including in the VA, to enable veterans and other individuals with PTSD and at times their family members to actually on an ongoing basis track and provide some input on what they're experiencing in terms of these kinds of PTSD symptoms from hour to hour, from day to day, over lengthy periods of days. And we know we, we did a study with, with mothers with young children who had PTSD and provided them with a couple of uh, interventions that proved generally relatively effective. When we looked at what those moms told us, um, and they were not associated with the military at all, but they were just women living in generally low-income families and dealing with multiple stressors, including PTSD from past trauma that they had experienced. When we looked at their day-to-day -day reports of their emotion state, of their symptoms, of their coping strategies, of their emotions, as, as I said as well, and their emotion regulation, that told us a great deal more than the single assessment that we could get by doing even the best structured interview. Uh, and so in some sense what we need is we need a kind of an ongoing assessment or paradigm where clinicians will track their observations of symptoms using measures such as the SOTS. Individuals can track the symptoms as well as how they are resiliently coping so we don't lose sight of that other side of the coin, which is so crucial to recovery from PTSD. 
and potentially where family members or other people in the individual's environment can provide input as well. Of course, there are all kinds of privacy issues, and those should be taken very seriously. Um, but as those are carefully attended to, this could be a way for people to actually observe change and much more accurately than we can potentially do just by simply uh, using the, the standard self-report and structured interview measures that we've relied upon up till now. So great point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ford. I actually have a question uh, for you based on a lot of the work you've done in children's PTSD and, and trauma. Uh, how does the way that children experience post-traumatic stress compare to what we see in adults? Is there a big difference? And since children's brains are still developing, do you think it's actually a unique biological process that's happening in children versus adults? Well, we know. That's a great question, Allison. And we know that there, there are fundamental similarities in the, the basic symptoms, but there are also differences. And so the DSM-5 has a separate subset of questions or items that are designed for children younger than six, for example, that have much more to do with intrusive re-experiencing popping up in the form of in reenactments in play, for example, where kids aren't going to go around saying, well, I'm, I'm remembering something terrible that happened, but their play may be dominated by reenactments of potentially or actually traumatic events, and that might actually reflect the, a difficulty that they're having with ongoing stress reactions. We also know that kids with PTSD tend to, they, they, uh, they tend to have higher levels of a stress hormone, cortisol, which actually is the stress hormone in the, uh, in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that actually shuts down or resets the stress response. Kids tend with PTSD tend to have high levels of just circulating cortisol. It's as if their bodies are constantly trying to inhibit a stress response. Adults with PTSD tend to have depleted or lower levels of, of cortisol. Not always, but very often. And so it's almost as if kids are in a kind of a constant state of hyperarousal and hypervigilance, whereas with adults it's more episodic. And it comes and it goes and it feels like it's all constant. But for kids, when they've been traumatized, they are, because of brain development, as you were saying as well, the amygdala develops much earlier than the prefrontal cortex. So children's job description is to be in a state of alarm. <laughs> and sometimes that alarm is because they're having fun. And sometimes that alarm is because they're experiencing danger. And sometimes it's because they're experiencing post-traumatic stress. So they are much more likely to be in a sort of a, an unmodulated alarm uh, mode simply because their prefrontal cortex has not developed the capacity or the pathways to modulate that response, as Dr. Teicher's uh, quotation told us earlier. So what we know is then with kids, it's very likely that they're going to experience reactions that seem to be just behavior problems emotional distress, meltdowns, and a lot of times kids with anxiety problems, with depression, with anger problems, with conduct problems are misdiagnosed or they're diagnosed with perhaps accurately sometimes even with ADHD, but there may be PTSD involved. It may be a comorbidity, and in some cases it may even be a better way of understanding the, the child's stress reactions or their hyperreactivity. So we have to be very open to that possibility, especially with kids who've been traumatized and then have very intense behavioral problems which tend to get identified as externalizing problems and not as post-traumatic stress. Wow, thank you. That's your whole talk and answering all these questions has been fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your deep knowledge about post-traumatic stress. Thank uh, we you. at Cohen Veterans Bioscience are very grateful for your time and we also would like to thank Prophase again for connecting us with you. Thanks so much and we'll sign off now. Thank you.